It's that time of the week again. It is Free Speech Fridays. I love that song. I really do. And it gets me in the mood for maybe having a quiet BB on a Friday afternoon. Um, who have we got joining us for Free Speech Fridays today? Well, because she's in after 10 anyway and she's here, my old mate Tina Nixon. Tina, how are you? Tina's actually in the studio with me. Very, very good. All right. And... From the Backbencher Pub, purveyors of fine dining, oh, pretty good dining, and uh, stuff to wet your whistle with, our old mate Boise, uh, Alistair Boyce. How are you going, mate? G'day, Sean. Very good. Hello, Tina. Morning, Alistair. And, right, and you got, now, have you guys met ever? Uh, a long, long time ago, because I was a, a guest on the Backbencher years ago. Um, ah. A couple of times, I think. Okay. All right. Well, you've met again now, and we're talking. Uh, guys, I just want to start, and I know you wouldn't have had time to be brief for this because we kind of broke or highlighted this story this morning. We have this group called Stop Co-Governance up in Northland. They go to hire a public venue owned by Sport Northland, which is basically a municipally backed body. It's a community organisation. It's got a, a stadium and it's got lounge. And they, oh, we want to have a public meeting. We're against co-governance, but we want to have a discussion in a public meeting. They offer their money to book the venue and Sport Northland, which strangely enough appears to be co-governed <laughs> and to be recognising to Tariti Waitangi and now has joint management, Pākehā and Māori. They say, no, we're not going to hire you the venue because we don't fundamentally agree with what you want to talk about or your attitude to co-governance. Uh, they have gone to the Human Rights Commission yesterday, say our rights under the Bill of Rights are being, uh, are, are being uh, messed around with. Uh, Tina, I reckon they've got a point. So you reckon sports? No, no, I reckon, uh, I reckon stop co-governance have got a point. We've got every politician saying we need to have a debate on this and we have a public oh, organisation saying, no, you can't have the debate here. Uh, look, totally, and it's a lost opportunity for um, Sports Northland because um, they should have been the first guests up hey, here's yeah. co-governance. This is how it works. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, what are your problems with it? We'll come and to your <laughs> meeting. We'll explain it to <laughs> you. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, here's the chart. Here's a platform to say, actually, co-governance isn't that bloody scary anyway. Yeah, but the problem um, is what works. they've done makes it scary. It makes it And that's it exactly what people are worried exactly. about in co-governance. They'll say they'll say probably it's an issue of public safety because the people who are against oh. co-governance are mad bastards and, and all of that. But that's just, that's just really stupid and shows a lack of... of confidence and bravery around debating some of those difficult issues. Yeah. Uh, Boise, what do you reckon? Yeah, it just exemplifies how divisive this whole thing is and how if you introduce something by stealth, the people will find you out um, and they will rebel against it. Um, and hence the pressure that's piled back onto this government and piled back onto our society and political system. This one has to be resolved and it has to be resolved sooner rather than later. So I'm bearing towards um, David Seymour's solution of putting it to the people, uh, getting the debate out there intelligently and effectively and everywhere possible. Everyone presents uh, what they've got and then the political parties have to start making stands. Um, so you're saying a referendum on co-governance. I see, I reckon I don't think a it's a bad thing. I, yeah. think, I think it's really important that the people have their say once they understand it. Now, some people think it's just all warm and fuzzies, this co-governance, but it's not. You could be, like with Three Waters, you could just be handing that economic power to, like, Coca-Cola or Heineken. Like, it, or, or because it's a Maori elite, it, it could be an economic elite, and they're an economic elite in New Zealand as it is. Mm. Yeah, there was no some of the tenor of uh, Shane Jones' and stuff yeah, yesterday. Yeah, you know, you talked to Shane yesterday. Um, I also have to apologise. We didn't get that up on the replay yesterday. We had a technical snuffer. It's going to be up today. Yeah, because it was a Shane. A Shane's really interesting, and and he he amplifies what I got over Christmas too. Talking to a lot of my Maori cousins and stuff, is that. Um, you know, they're, they're scared about the change, the pace of change around some of this thing, this, this stuff, and feel that the pendulum's sw sh gone too far the other way. Um, and, and so there's a lot of disquiet even amongst Māori around how this is going. And, I mean, Shane is just like, nah, co-governance uh, on issues that are public assets, um, that are publicly owned by specific communities, it's not going to work. Um, and and uh, interestingly enough, he said that uh, basically he reckons the entire Māori caucus has got the focus wrong and should be trying to work out how they can improve the economic status of their own people with the assets that they own like fish and forestry. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Look, guys, the other thing, I, and we probably should have started there, but I, I'm slightly sick of saying, oh, you know, 
Chris Hipkins is wearing this today and he went here today and he went there today. But we have in the last week, we have in the last week had one of the smoothest transitions of power inside a government that I've ever seen, which, as Chris Trotter and Bomber and Bryce Edwards rightly pointed out on my show on Monday, clearly was a jack-up job. Uh, senior members in the Labor Party knew she was going well before Christmas. Apart from the Maori caucus. Apart from the Maori <laughs> caucus, precisely. <laughs> so there's no way they were scrambling to put this together, eh, Boise? This was well managed, mate. Yeah, no, it was orchestrated by that that uh, side of the um, Labor Party, and you can definitely see a schism um, to that Maori caucus. Mahuta put up a hand straight away to go for leader. Uh, not knowing that um, it was, it was a done deal. It was, it was done already anyway. a done deal, yeah. <laughs> well, so why would she put a hand up and make herself look stupid and alienated? Yeah, like, yeah. Look, my yeah. understanding too, Boise, was, and look, I just want to shout out to Willie Jackson. He's crook. He's crook. He's pretty crook. He's had some surgery, I understand, on his throat, and they're saying it's a COVID complication. Let's see. Let's see if it is. But my understanding is he left the caucus media in Napier at quite a critical junction. Oh. And there was a possibility that Kerry Allen, the Maori caucus, could have got together, crunched numbers, and, and got Kerry Allen as Deputy Prime Minister. She's but, not that popular in the caucus, though. Mm, mm. Uh, and what happened was Carmel's, Carmel Cipollone, who I think was Cunliffe's numbers person mm, when Cunliffe right. was leader, she saw the opportunity, she got in there at Dundee. Mm. And, and, and Willie really hasn't been very, very well, and maybe... And let's be honest, it is actually Willie Jackson who holds that Maori caucus uh, mm. together, not Nanaia Mahuda. He's, he's the guy who does, you know, who wields the whip in the Maori caucus. I, I think we might have problems ahead, Tina, as they realise that there has been a shift in power. Yeah, well, it'll be a, a, a test of uh, Hipkins' political management, which you know is reasonably deft, um, to ensure that he doesn't disenfranchise that Maori caucus too much and does give them some positions. I think the Nyamahoot is actually going to be um, the thorn in the side of this government because that caucus has a lot of respect for her, um, but it's clear that her performance and skullduggery around the back of uh, the Three Waters um, and some other issues is, has really upset some of the mainstream members of the Labour caucus. Yeah, yeah, OK. Do you think, Boise, this change of leadership, and I note, for example, the backroom people are hardly changing at all. Mm. The people who ran the exclusionary pay favourites uh, policy in media and... Uh, just in his office, you know, Andrew Camelot, he's still there. Yeah, Raph's yeah. gone, though. Ra oh, oh, OK. Yeah. So there have been some changes. But, Boise, is this anything more than, um, and I can't be accused of being misogynistic when I say, but is Chris Hipkins anything but lipstick on a pig? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, window dressing. Um, <laughs> the fundamental thing is they've driven this change through the state sector. So the whole state sector is now operating towards this... Um, co-governance model um, I'm aware of a lot of commercial arrangements now that are just on hold praying for a, a change of government because they're just treading water um, through this con endless consult consultation process where you have to go to local iwis or whatever um, and you can't get anything done and that you, you have to um, acquiesce all through the process and this is transactions of private land not, not public property or anything private mm -hmm. land that, that um, developers want to develop and um, get, get local economies working, and especially in the rural sector. So we all know the problems in the rural sector, and that's why it was so disgusting that the government took to them when they're vulnerable, um, because the rural poor are vulnerable, because they're slightly off the grid. Um, yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the, the social problems, if you can imagine the rural sector, it's really important to put yourself in the rural sector's shoes. It's sparsely populated and you've got um, vulnerable people, you know, mothers, families, uh, etc., living and, uh, in uh, farmhouses and uh, isolated houses. Um, and then you get a whole lot of social unrest and unease economically and they're totally vulnerable to um, home invasions and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and everything else. And the gangs else. are strong in some provincial areas as well. That's right. Yeah, OK. Um, 
And we have a really bad story in Masterton where um, uh, uh, the White Rap is an anomaly in terms of housing, social housing. So the social housing from Upper Hutt through to Flaxmere is run by a thing called the Masterton Trust House, which used to be the old licensing trust. Yeah. And Jenny Shipley years ago did a deal with them and basically gave them all the, all the housing for bugger all. And um, since then, uh, they've run the social housing for Flaxmere right through to, to the hut. Uh, and... Uh, and just before, I think it was just before Christmas, they put their their rates up for these people in social housing up a hundred percent. Wow! And and so the whole community is just absolutely aghast. Now, my understanding is that Trust House has had some difficulties with Kayanga Ora and trying to forge some partnerships. Um, so I'm not sure whether this is a, a, a because the Trust House has um, put their hands up and gone. We have to put the the rents up um, because uh, actually we can't afford to maintain these properties anymore. So we've got to do this. Um, and if you've got a problem with the tenants, go and see MSD. So they're chucking the bloody problem back to the um, to the government. So it's a very cynical ploy, if that is the case, that they are using the tenants to score a political point. Yeah. The second point is, is if it is literally because they have not maintained these properties over a couple of decades and every bloody trustee that's sitting on that trust should resign because they haven't done the fundamental basics of bloody um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and actually provided decent housing for these people. Mm. And, and so, you know, it's a, it's, it, that's the sort of thing that's happening out there. It doesn't get front-page news. If it was in here in Wellington, it would be all over the Dom and everyone would be talking about it. Mm. But this is a, a, a thing that a pe a impacts, I think they've got nearly 500 houses. You know, so this is a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Hey, guys, do we think Chippy can save? And, look, let's just be brutally honest. Everyone can read a poll, can see which way, way the wind's blowing. Um, Labor in big trouble. Um, Jacinda gone. Chris Hipkins in. Can he reorientate Labor to the middle of the political spectrum and give them a chance at winning the next election or the centre-left a chance at winning the next election or not? Tina? Um, <sighs> yeah, he can. Uh uh, but I, I, I'm a bit like Richard Preble. They should call a snap election because the policy U-turns that Chippy's going to have to make to put them in another direction is not what they campaigned on yeah. and it's not what the people voted them for. Yeah, so there's and, no and mandate left. There's no mandate. So, you know, um, and Shane and I talked about this yesterday too and he says, yeah, it'll be a, hot, a cold day in hell before they call a snap election. But, you know, the... the if they have a moral obligation uh, to check with their voters, I think, but they won't. Um, yeah. I, they're not going to be interested in it. But, uh, yeah, I don't think the U-turn is... Um I, I don't think it's enough to get them over line because the people are still too bloody angry with them over too, on too many yeah, issues France, yeah, yeah. Um, for even a U-turn to be seen as anything but cynical. Yep. And I reckon it'll be lipstick on a pig yep. in terms of policies like Three Governance and stuff as well. Anyway. Yep. Uh, three, three Waters. Yeah, Boise, do you think you can turn around? I, th I think you'll have um, a little honeymoon period and I think then the, the electorate will tire of him as they realise that there's no fundamental change. Yeah. Um, I think we all realise, well, certainly in this conversation, that the Wellington state sector bubble is bigger uh, than it's ever been and it's uh, full of excess, basically, and, and people, the work-from-home model is just rampant through it, so it's got no productivity. But it also... Um, has no feeling outside its own bubble, it feeds itself. So it doesn't realise the pain in the rural community mm. or in the small business community. Hipkins has made a good move uh, immediately by communicating into business. But mm. the reality is, what has happened, what, I don't see how he can do anything mm. in seven months. He, he can only form a more effective campaign to go into the election. I don't think they'll call a snap election. Yeah. He'll just... Um, uh, potter through and try and get the policy settings right for the next um, for the campaign, you know, that this is where we are going to go. I don't see how he can overturn the, or, or turn back the juggernaut, or even yeah. he might be able to slow it a wee bit, but, but yeah. this is all in process, you know. I know. But, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you one bloody group that he could jump on to show a real thing. He could stop any public funding of Kate Hanna and the disinformation project and all these experts, and we've had this ridiculous thing this week, the suggestion, even though she personally denies it, that Jacinda Ardern, the former Prime Minister, was somehow hand hounded oh. from office by male chauvinist pigs. And the Alison Moores and the 
Verity Johnson. And the Nadine Porters and, and, and Doug Avery. And, and Kate Hanna, who I understand is in the Herald again, won't give us a bloody interview because she doesn't want to answer real questions. But to me, that was also an indication of how bad our media is, that they just kept banging that drum and refused to accept, Tina, that maybe people <laughs> just didn't like Jacinda Ardern very much because of her policies. Well, that's what I was saying yesterday. I can't, I, you know, I, I've never had any respect for her. I always remember <laughs> when she first got in and Matthew Hooter, my good mate, texted and he says, wow, this is pretty interesting. And I, I just think she's flaky. And he, he actually mentioned the word flaky in one of his um, columns. Oh, he's a misogynist bastard, isn't he? <laughs> And I thought, yeah, and, and I've never really deviated from that myself. You know, she's been really done good stuff on the international stage. She'll be the poster person for um, an, an international trade and, and getting us on the world stage. But she was a shit manager of government. That yeah. was it. Yeah. Boise, did yeah, you... No, she said she said and more. Now, her pseudo-intellectualism is totally flawed. So she's a globalist but she can't work out whether she's a communist or a capitalist. <laughs> so the, the, the net result of, of her um, uh, of her policies has been the poor get poorer, the rich get richer, the disadvantaged uh, get more disadvantaged. I mean, small businesses now, if you want to get a Marxist analysis, she, this is how confused she is, okay? So the bureaucracy, the state sector, is now the new bourgeoisie. The new working class is small business, and the new proletariat is the rural poor. That's there you a go. bloody good way of How putting it. How confused is that? Yeah, How well said. How confused is that? Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Um, but we don't think they're going to have an early election. Now, Boise, as you would have heard and you've communicated with me on this, we're having the idea that we'll just have a big party on election night at the platform. Yeah, I'm really keen for that, Sean. Sure. Okay, too. well, we'll have to make some sort of commercial deal here. It could be very <laughs> yeah, good yeah, for you. Yeah, we can do that. As long as co-governance not involved, I I'll am not consulting from the a rapper. local oh, yeah. oh, Okay. <laughs> I'll have to talk to my Maori spiritual advisors <laughs> about that. Uh, well, uh, just uh, keep the tanny far away, you know. It's a lot of bad luck out there. Yeah. We don't want oh, come on, there's the other side of that question. Well, look, I've, look, got, look, I've look, got a kawa kawa plant, plant growing in my backyard <laughs> right at the moment. And by crikey, Maori were onto it when they knew about that herb or tree as it is. Oh my so God! Many are, you, are you sure it's kawa kawa? Yeah, it's definitely kawa kawa. What does kawa kawa do? Um, it's got a bit of a numbing effect, <laughs> 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 and it has antiseptic properties. And yeah. actually, there's a scientific study just recently out that says all the things that Maori have said, said that it does actually. It does, and we need to do some more investigation about it. Okay. So, you know, they get stuff right. We do get stuff right. All right. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, Alex and I, Sean, we can still do a bit of a panel, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no. no. What I'm, th I'm working on the format. It's going to be sort of a rolling thing like the yeah, old yeah, days of TV3. Well, you know, party, but let, let's have a bit of fun with it. Yeah, you know? yeah. All right, all right. Let, we will talk about that further, but hopefully we've got some time to plan. There was no snap election. Look, I do want to talk about things, and not just about co-governance. Things Maori this week. We know that all the polls and research says that the biggest concern about, amongst New Zealanders is the economy and inflation and stuff. And Hitkins says that's what he's going to deal with, and that's where the battleground is. I, I'm going to make a suggestion to you that that's what people think they have to say when they answer these surveys. Mm. But I'm going to put it to you that the actual the issues we've just been talking about, co-governance, the role of the treaty, that is underlying the issue that people are most concerned about. Nah. No, you don't nah, think so? No, nah, nah, it's definitely cost of living. Uh, you know, honestly and truly, I've uh, yeah, uh, and, it's, and and I think what's what she's saying, you know, it, uh, in the rural areas, it's just so stark. You know, you're walking into the supermarket and you're seeing people who are really sad buying groceries. Older people are doing lots of comparative shopping, which they wouldn't have. They'd have just chuck stuff in their yeah. in their in, in their shopping trolleys. People are really being very considered about what what they're buying. Everyone I've talked to since I've been here in the last two days is saying the same things. They are terrified of the cost of living right at the moment and everywhere they look their life the cost of their lives is increasing and it is really worrying them mm. and it worries I'll them give you a couple of people. facts Sean mm. I'll, I'll give you a couple of facts in the Wellington sector okay so I roast coffee um, wholesale uh, coffee inflation is running at 40% wow. fruit and veg wholesale wholesale is yeah. 40% yeah. so those are just two main categories so yeah. what, what happens is we absorb that we've only put up our prices once at 20% so yeah. for coffee fruit and veg the the 
um, my main supplier is the main supplier onto the Wellington CBD. Um, he, he's the same. He's not. He hasn't risen. He hasn't kept his margin. If he did, he would be really, really wealthy. But at the other end, like at the coalface of producing the food, they can't get the immigrant staff. You know, they can't get the workers. So, uh, what their model in the interim, and you can see it with the eggs as well. Um, you don't meddle with the markets, okay? You provide parameters. So um, w- what this government don't under- uh, understand is um, you uh, do something like with eggs or, or, or um, fruit and veg production, you know, things that are produced, you um, uh, limit the market by saying it's only no caged eggs, okay? So mm. the supply goes down. The supply won't go up if it doesn't have to because they're after profit, okay? So um, they'll they'll just, uh, until the market recorrects, it can take a decade for a market to recorrect. Um, So you've got a smaller supply with a higher profit. Why are they going to change that model quickly? Mm. Yeah. They All, don't right. Need to. All right. All right. I hear you telling me that I'm wrong and saying that I think uh, race underlying is the issue that, that drives New Zealand. Oh, no, I, I agree with you. Race is a major issue. It's absolute major. Mm. Um, but the cost of living, it, it's always the power of someone's pocket is always going to mm. outweigh everything else. So yeah. if they believe they're losing a bit of democracy, but for most people, that's a really abstract term, okay? Not yeah. for us, but for most people. But the dollar in the pocket will still be the major determinant of, of the election. All right, all right. Look, um, also this week, and geez, it's been a, a start to the year. It's just kicked off hugely. Uh, we had Ratna, and I'm sorry, I look at Ratna and I just, <laughs> I just scratch my fricking head. It's like the Murray Church Scientology, um, and it seems <laughs> archaic and weird. But it's the opening stanza of politics for the year. Um, and it's religion. If it was Catholics and Catholics said, hey, let's get, have the Prime Minister here, everyone would go, whoa, what's going on here? What, yeah. But because it's a Māori bloody church, everyone says it's fine. You ever been off. up to Ratan? I mean, I've nope, visited there. Nope, nope, oh, I just nope, had a look around as a Don't believe in the Māori king either because I'm not a monarchist. So, you know, it's really hard for some Māori in those old institutions. Um, and, you know, I respect people's rights to uh, practice religion and whatever they want to do, but I don't have to. And as far as I'm concerned, Ratna is a and is a just a, a bloody fossil of the old times. Yeah. And do you, have you ever got it, Boise, or do you like me sit there and scratch your head? I scratch my head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh look, the other person we lost this week, and I think she is a significant New Zealander, and she's worth mentioning, guys, is Titify Harawira, who I met on a number of occasions, interviewed a fair few times. She was the woman who made Helen Clark cry. That's right. And, and, and that's saying woman, something. She also is the woman who beat vulnerable people in her care and went to jail for it. That's right. And that is yep. the now, other side. Now, I knew there was something there and I hadn't mentioned it because I knew you would know it. Tell us that story. Oh, look, I, I can only have vague recollections of it, but she was in charge of a mental um, health facility and they were vulnerable Māori and she beat the, her and her daughter, I think it was, beat yeah. the crap out of them. That's right. And they went to jail for it and it just, you know, there's a the thing is, is I hate bloody whitewashing of people's past. I own mine, and you know, and for people just to forget about that, mm. um, and we Maori that will actually mention that at the tangi because yeah. that's a good thing about tangi. You can say here's a really shit thing she did, yeah, um, and, and that'll probably. But be But I display, watched one but, news yeah. last night. It was like Jacinda Ardern. It was the beatification, the yeah, martyrdom of Tita Whaiarawe. Yeah, and quite a few of my friends were talking about that yesterday, and uh, and they were like, in fact, one of them I think has um, decided not to go to the tangi as a result. So you know, the um, it, 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 you just don't. Just don't try and make people out to be saints after that. Just be honest about it. No one's perfect, but don't. Yeah, don't but in, say in the environment of Maori wonderfulness, wonderfulness <sighs> we have now, our mainstream news media are never going to raise the sort of things exactly. you just raised here on the platform, exactly. Tina. Exactly. And I greatly appreciate that you did, um, because it is so easy. Oh, we won't say anything bad. We won't mention that because we want to be. Part of, we want to be the cool kids who'll get the interview with the Prime Minister, which is the way Jacinda used to run it. Uh, your thoughts as a misogynist at white post-colonial male on Titify Harawira, Boise? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of thoughts um, on Titify Harawira, apart from um, the, the truth should be the truth. Um, let's not deify people. Uh, the, 
this was absolutely ridiculous, the, the mainstream media, how they have deified Jacinda Ardern. Oh, yeah, but um, treat that, her like Jesus. You can tuck the enemy to... down. <laughs> hey? tuck, treat her like Jesus. That was literally a quote in the media well, from Ratner. Ratner. <laughs> Just chucks the hem of her korowai of her... her, her. <laughs> I can't get. I had with actually on, predicted sorry. that that would happen the day before. I said, "Here, what is what's going to happen?" <laughs> and look, I hate yeah. to think, Boise, what's going to happen when Easter comes? Someone's going to put Jacinda Ardern on a cross <laughs> and, or roll back a stone. <laughs> oh, it just irritates me so much that that's why I had to write that opinion piece and yeah, and good piece. And smack it off to you because I just I couldn't cope with this. Um, rewriting of history. I yeah. mean, it's only just happened, but but the interpretation from the mainstream media was so off. It was. I, I still think uh, your Friday morning with Trotter and um, oh yeah, they were Bradbury amazing. and then Winston Peters. That was just a media coup. Um, having the left wing discuss it was totally the right thing to do. Yeah, well, I just thought, well, no one in ACT knows what's going on, and no one in National will no. either. So you know, no, yeah. No, and they know what they're doing, but they've got no idea, and that was just illuminating. You'll notice how um, Chris Trotter is the only one brave enough. I mean, I've sort of mentioned it, but he's the only one brave enough to come out with the fact that if you push the people too far and you divide them too hard, mm -hmm. and you've got a, a combination here economically and with this co ridiculous co-governance uh, that no one knows what it is, and the people who are prescribing it don't know what it is, you've got a double sword here, and if you push it too far, uh, then, you know, the state has to uh, enforce uh, the idiocy of the government. Yeah. So <laughs> that means police power. Yeah. And you would have seen in the occupation protest at one point, they're trying to, trying to bring in the army in the guise of removing the vehicles. Well, yeah. the army are trained to kill people, not remove vehicles. Yeah, yep, that's true. Uh, hey. they, they should have seen it. Like, and, they, and then they just doubled down. After yep. the occupation protest, it was already totally evident there was a schism in New Zealand society mm, yep. that caused the whole of Wellington to be gridlocked. Oh, you are um, such a misogynist. You're just doing it because she's a strong, <laughs> young, independent woman. <laughs> I'm cutting you off now. Hey, boys, it's great to have you uh, back on the platform. Teeny, you've been doing sterling work yesterday, and I'm sure today, too, you're filling in for Michael Rawls. Thank you both for a very illuminating free speech Friday.